There is an earlier garment called a manga mm -hmm. in early Spanish colonial days, and it was a solid piece of cloth, and it had a round neck piece that went over it, mm -hmm. and those were always elaborately decorated with gold and silver embroidery. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of those were melted down right mm -hmm. after Mexican independence because they were the peninsular's mm -hmm. textile. Yeah. And so they melted them down for the gold and silver weight. Now, they were still good Catholics, mm -hmm. so they did not meant melt down ecclesiastical garments. Mm -hmm. So those with the gold and silver survived. The mangas didn't. Mm -hmm. And I have the only really true surviving example of one that really shows how decadent it is. Mm. And it's got Habsburg double-headed eagles, both with snakes in their mouths wow. and stuff. And it's it's a solid piece of a hard-worsted indigo blue cloth, totally gold and silver and silk embroidered. <laughs> did you know what it was did when you, you first saw it? Well, I did because I've seen, you know, illustrations of it. I've seen them in drawings and I heard the term a lot. Right. And Mike McKissick came up with it mm. in in some early, early estate out of Texas. Did a podcast with him, too, if you want you to did? Yeah, yeah, I figured. And he yeah. had figured out what it was. He go, And so when I saw him at the High Noon <laughs> show, which was the little show in Prescott, was first. And I said, you, and he goes, I have something you're going to want. I have a manga. And I said, you know what a manga is? He goes, well, I've never seen one, but I'm pretty sure this is a manga. And he pulled it out. I dropped dead. It was so unbelievable. <laughs> so I bought it. Did from you say me. that's fun? That's fun. Yeah, I was like that made my that made my show. Nothing could have nothing could have made me happier. And so I quickly folded it up. It's pretty heavy and weighty, obviously. And I put it in my car. I wasn't going to show anybody anything. And then I realized there's Jeter, Haskell, Bradford to a less degree, Hengespaugh. Yeah, all in this booth together, and they've seen the most Spanish colonial stuff you see, and certainly leather work or woodwork that would much predate textiles. Right. So I then broke, I broke it out, and I walked over to the booth, and I laid it down on the floor in front of the booth, and every and people just gathered around instantly. Go, my God, what is that thing? And I'm going, well, it's a manga, and they go, wow, and they go, how old is it? And I'm going, I don't really know how old this thing is. I mean. But in my research, this thing should be pretty old. And it had the Habsburg double-headed eagles. It had the snakes and everything on it. It had all this other iconography. And I was, I wanted them to date the iconography that was in it because I figured they had word. And so I said, you know, it could be Maximilian's manga with uh, with the Habsburg right. eagles because th he was a Habsburg. But I said, I really think it's older than that. Mm -hmm. And so... Everybody's, there's all the people was gathered around. Everybody's popping a million questions. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. And it's pretty spectacular. So I'll ask the questions. In the meantime, Jeter is standing. There's the, it's on the floor and there's a showcase and Jeter's standing behind the showcase. And I'm kind of looking up at him and he's going like this. He's just like, it's like he's got a scanner in his eyes and he's <laughs> scanning it and, and all the different iconography and everything. And then he keeps scanning it and scanning it. Everybody was kind of talking about everything, and he finally goes, it's 17th century. <laughs> and everybody goes, 17th century? That's for the 1600s. Yeah. And everybody goes, really? He goes, oh, yeah, there's that brown deer that was a Mexican deer. They became extinct by the, yeah. by the you know, early 1700s. They, they killed them all. They were really good eating, and so there was none of those left. So it has those brown deer. And he, he's all the, in the way the lines, it's got these lions with these big puffy kind of beards, and there's Chena Poblana ladies with white white blouses and big red skirts with embroidery on them holding the lion's mouths right. open and stuff. It's got all this iconography that I knew they could read. And so whether it's that early or not, I don't know, but that was... That was the best opinion. And the other guys, you know, he started citing, well, that we never see, we don't ever see that after this year, right. this year. So he was, he was running through. And so great if it is, it's a magnificent textile. But it helps tell the story. It tells the story. Yeah. And so. Uh, and part of the other story, actually, is that we haven't talked about are Rio Grande blankets, New Mexican blankets. Yes. Which are a 
critically important component too. Yeah, and those are really an offshoot of the Saltillos. Yeah, you know the they, Bazan brothers, right? They did uh, a lot of uh, uh, weaving. The weaving industry got started early by the by the sixteen hundreds. There's reports of of uh, the governor of New Mexico having a weaving factory that was making textiles they were exporting back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. New Mexico was basically a giant weaving factory. That's what it was. And so the Indians wove, the, the, the Pueblo Indians would weave for the Spanish, the Navajos became enslaved and would weave for the Spanish, and the Spanish wove. So thousands of textiles were shipped annually from New Mexico to Mexico, and presumably a lot of them came, you know, made it onto Europe. Um, so another thing that and I... When do you think the earliest, or what is the earliest... Saltillo, New Mexico, Saltillo. So well, Saltillo design. style. Yeah. Okay, so what we see in New Mexico was New Mexico was a much colder climate than Mexico, right. and so they needed a blanket with more substance. The initial ones were probably the banded styles, mm -hmm. and then they started introducing Saltillo motifs within the bands, the 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 manita leaf or just different types of cherry. For, for when they were probably were Navajo slaves weaving, they were probably terrace, Navajo-style designs. Hispanic weavers would have done serrate designs, and that developed into a full Saltillo-style blanket. Mm -hmm. For some reason, they eliminated the end borders, and they went to just bands. So Saltillos have a full border. four-sided border. Right. Real Grands don't. Their border Genial. ends on the sides, yeah. and they have banded end panels mostly. Right. There's only three or four that have full borders yeah. on them. And uh, so, but they were, they're expensively, they were extensively done and worn, you know, like the, they were, and they were traded to Mexico. I'm sure the natives wore them as well as the Hispanic wore mm -hmm. them. And so, and that's another big love of mine, of course, is the real grand yeah, blanket. So you and I share that. Kind of an offshoot of mm -hmm. them. They kind of are neat because they combine the native and they combine the Spanish. So mm -hmm. they're kind of the best of both worlds. In them, so I happen to like them. They're not fine like saltillos. It's a cold climate, so they used mostly plied wool warps. So it was a thicker warp, right? Which made a which made a thicker textile. Mm -hmm. And so, and did they they had cochineal that they could actually use? Well, not really. The cochineal market primarily went to Europe. Mm -hmm. So mostly, what was obtained in the Rio Grande Valley was Rabble. was rabble yeah. materials yeah. that the Navajos used. Called bayeta, they take a uh, red cloth apart. Right, and so it's an interesting story because here the cochineal comes from Mexico. The cochineal is shipped to Europe. Cloth comes is back. red cloth is woven in Europe, and then it's traded back right. into Mexico, traded up in the New Mexico, and then it's taken apart strand for strand. Yeah. You also see, which you don't really see in saltillos. Saltillos are primarily hand spun materials mm -hmm. and hand dyed where you see plied yarns and so the plied yarns got up into New Mexico but they were expensive and so you don't see a lot of plied yarns in Rio Grande blankets but you don't see them in saltillos till really late. you never see it in an early saltillo mm -hmm. um, and the saltillos were mostly hand plied cotton warp and that's a prehistoric technique mm -hmm. to hand ply the warp by hand plying the warp it gives it more tinsel strength mm -hmm. and so uh, the Spanish saw that the natives did that so they insisted they did it so most all saltillos have hand plied cotton warps there's a little bit of hand plied wool it's pretty rare mm -hmm. but mostly it's hand plied cotton there's one type of saltillo that has single ply cotton warp only one type I've ever seen it in and when you say one type you don't mean one blanket, you mean a type, a type of that blanket. A type of blanket. And what is that type? And so it's it's what we call a zigzag. I'd have to show you an example of one. And this is a saltillo. It's a saltillo serape. Mm -hmm. But apparently that was what they did. They just used single-ply cotton warps. Now, we see saltillos, they're very, very similar to each other. 
possibly or probably made by the same hand, mm -hmm. you know. So we don't know if it's the same weaver. We don't know if it's a workshop. Like Navajo weaving was a cottage industry, so the weavers worked independently. Yeah. And, and if they got into a slaving kind of situation, they were a little more forced to be in some kind of a workshop potentially. But saltillos were more of an industry. Now, one of the systems that really took over in Spain was the guild system. Mm -hmm. And the guild system, which, which came from Europe, was a division of labor. So you had the apprentice and you had the you know, master craftsmen and the different levels in between. And so that ruled the what are called obrajes, the weaving workshops. And so you would work your way up depending how good you were. And so you would have a probably a person that spun the warps, you know, and probably plied somebody them. and plied them on the cotton. There was probably a different person that spun the wefts. Right. There was probably another person that was the master dyer yep. that would dye them because literally on most good saltillos, the color that the kosher right, needle is at one end is the exact same yeah. color at the other end. And you probably had a warper that probably did the warping of the looms and setting them up, and then you would have had a master weaver. Some people speculate that the diamond was done by a different person than the rest of the saltillo because hmm. there's a lot of contrast in the diamond to the rest of it. But I don't see it as really being a different weaver. I just see it as, you know, as just a different design to make it stand out. And do you think most of these weavings were done in that fashion? And they, they, were, they were primarily all done in that fashion, mm. yeah. And so... It allows you to get consistency. Well, that's... And so what we, <clears throat> what we choose to do now when we see things that are very, very similar, the term we use is point-specific. Not the same weaver, because we don't know. Not really the same workshop, we don't know, but they come from the same point. There's something common about mm. them that takes them from a specific point. And it's in the coloration, it's in the preparation yeah, of the materials. Sure. Yeah, every different little things. It's the end finishes, if you still, if you're lucky enough to have a saltillo that still has an original end finishes. They're similar. So our term that we use, we've adapted to now is point specific. It's from the same point. Mm. But and we, we don't so will know. your book be broken into that kind of thing where it's like these are those types of point point pieces. to some it'll mention that issue you know people think about Navajo weaving and they think about the regional styles the two gray hills were done here and the ganados were done here and the right. tisas were done there so people have taken that mentality and tried to apply it to the saltillos mm. that the round ones were done here right. and the diamond ones were done here the and reds, these were done the here and yeah and people have always tried to solve the problem by putting different ones in different areas we're not sure that's really appropriate. Mm. It's appropriate to a certain degree, but maybe not completely. I found, in we only in saltillo research, you only find pearls. You don't really find a bunch of them. You find <laughs> just one little pearl. Well, I found a really rare, obscure book on weaving in the state of Durango. Mm. And it's from 1830s. And it has a list of the serapes that were done throughout the state of Durango and the types. This many blues, this many whites, this mm. many reds. And so so obviously they were doing more than just one type. Yeah, so there's a Rosetta Stone right there. Yeah, uh, so that's a great Rosetta Stone, but it's the only thing we have. And a lot of those went uh, went on to Europe. They were traded. They went to Mexico City and picked were picked up by the trade systems and taken to Europe, it's listed. So do we know how accurate these guys were in textile industry and everything? We don't really know how much they knew about it. They mm. were writing about it, and so that's all we get was you know things writing about it. The early lithographs, starting with a guy named Claudio Linotti, he was the first lithographer in Mexico. Mm -hmm. He went there in 1820, and he drew costumes. And he went back to Europe in 1825, and in 18 and he set up the first lithography studio in Mexico City mm -hmm. to start producing lithographs. He published a book called Costume, Civilian, Military, and Religious of Mexico in 1828 in Brussels, 
And so that's really one of our really good Rosetta Stones because we know exactly. There's two real schools of thought. A lot of people think because there's no really 18th century mention or collected examples that they didn't exist in the 18th century. They just sort of popped up in the mm -hmm. early 1800s. It's just in a fully developed form and right. fabulous. But that's when the lithograph starts, so that's what we have. There's no photography, right? But we see them profusely in the lithographs and paintings. Yes, and paintings. I've sent you some, I think, when I found them in museums. Yes, like, oh, it's, the... so it's hard to imagine it just popped up out of nowhere in a fully developed form. It doesn't make any sense to no. me. So the earliest actually documented collected one mm -hmm. was well, they say that two of them were gotten from uh, Santa Ana. And went to San and went to uh, Sam Houston during the Battle of San Jacinto, and that was 1836. Mm. So those were considered the earliest documented. I looked up, I in depth looked up the history of the families that gave them and who actually collected them, and it was there was big gaps in the pieces. So I just didn't believe that. Santa, and if you know the history of it, you know Santa Ana did fine at the Alamo, and he had you know, three, four, five thousand troops, and there's only 200 Texans. Right. So he was happy with that. At Santa Ana, he still had 10, 15,000 troops, but there was 5,000 Texans. And yeah. I'm just making numbers up. So it was only three or four to one. He didn't like those odds, so he decided he was going to get the hell out of Dodge. So he dressed down as a pauper, snuck away from his troops, got caught by some of Santa Ana, or uh, Sam Houston's sentries. And he had a wooden leg. And so they find this guy who spoke very well, right. seemed very sophisticated, but he was dressed as a pauper. So smartly enough, they took him to Santa Ana and said, you know, something wrong with this guy. And uh, he admitted he was Santa Ana and he was trying to get out of there yeah. before the battle. And then he gave Texas to save his own life, he gave Texas to the Texans. Yeah. So there really was never a huge battle there because Santa Ana basically gave up the odds. But supposedly he had a saltillo. Now he's dressed as a pauper. A pauper's not going to be wearing a saltillo serape. That would be the signal flag. So I yeah. doubt the story. But there was a guy hired by the Times Picu in a newspaper in New Orleans to leave from St. Louis and go over the the uh, Santa Fe Trail, and write about it. Mm. And so he wrote these journals. He sent them back by courier, and this was in 1839, and the Times Picayune published his travels mm. to, to New Mexico. And so he picked up a saltillo while he was in Santa Fe. Mm. I bought it out of Matt Field's family. It was mm. the only time he was ever out west. Mm. So we believe that's probably the earliest. That's truth, 1839. 1839. Mm. But we have nothing earlier than that. We have mentions of them. The earliest use of the word is in is in 1757. Father a, a, a Jesuit priest was at what was called the Hacienda de Pathos outside of Saltillo, and he mentions the weaving studios that around the hacienda and he mentions the weaving serapis he uses the word that's the earliest use of the word we've ever seen and he uses the word serape or... he uses the word serape mm -hmm. but we don't know what he means by it right just what just... could it have been in yeah. 17 we don't really know but then we start seeing the word used more towards the end of the 18th century and then profusely by the beginning of the 19th century so if he's right, if it was really was a Serapi and that's what it is, we can take it back to 1750s, which we think it probably goes back further than that. But yeah. we really have no proof. So there's two schools of thought. My school of thought is they develop in the early 1700s to mid 1700s. The other school of thought is if there's no proof, they're not around, doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So there's this whole school right. of thought that says basically it's a 19th century garment. But I don't believe it, but, yeah. but I can't prove it either. So the, supposedly this guy came up with a 1725 use of the word. And somebody in Mexico published that the word was used in the 1725 garment. It took me almost 10 years 
to get a copy of that document. <laughs> I just got it recently, a couple months ago. Yeah. I finally got the actual document. Right. It was a will that it was mentioned in, and it's there's no you the word Serapi is not, not in, there. in there. It's not in there. Sure but they've made a big thing out of it how they pushed the date back to 25, 35 years and yeah. made a big thing in 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 the Mexican kind of textile community has exalted this thing. And I kept asking everybody that I knew down there, let me see, how is the term used? What are they saying? Is it spelt with a Z? Is it spelt with an S? Is it spelt with an A? Is right. it spelt with an E? How's it spelled? I was real curious. Well, they didn't like my question, so nobody would let me at this garment or the the uh, document. And it was it. I finally figured out where the archives was, who this was. It was a will of a wealthy Mexican had died, and that's where it was mentioned in it. And, and the word serape isn't even in there. Carpeta. Yeah. A carpet. Yeah. And there was a table that had these five finely woven carpetas on yeah. them. It had nothing to do with the word serape. Yeah. And so, but that's how in depth we've really looked for that term. We know the 1757, but that document was destroyed. And so all we actually have is a document that copied contemporaneously yes. was a copy of that document. Yes. So it's not the actual, it wasn't Morphy's actual writing and somebody that wrote what he but wrote. But done at the same time. But done at the yeah. same time. So yeah. that's but better. But it's still a carpet. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so the idea of, and I know more questions, everything I've ever looked up, every avenue I've changed, it's just dead end streets. As far as you can go, it ends. This is why you like these. I love them because it's, of that. It's, it's a, a puzzle. It's a puzzle. It's and that's a, what, Besides the beauty, and you understand what beauty is in weaving, and, you, but it's the puzzle for you. And you will just only find a little pearl <laughs> to kind of put together. <laughs> and the pearl makes us ask more questions, yeah. you know, expands the question. So who knows? I thought 35, 40 years ago when I started this thing, I know all about saltillos. I don't. <laughs> you know? It's, it's, it's frustrating. They're still just as beautiful. I love the art, and yeah. I'm amazed at the workmanship, but we don't really know much yeah. about them. It's that combo of beauty, textile mastery, which you can look at and see, because yeah. you you know you specialize in Two Great Hills, which are some of the finest weavings in North America. Yeah. And yet, you know, this puzzle component to me seems really... It's what and fascinating <laughs> well if you look at the two gray hills i was able to resolve them i went there i started collecting them yes in the 80s and we i know we talked about it the other time but i was able to in 25 years find out who the weavers were how the families were yeah. related that's what my book is all about and so i was able to do that i haven't been able to do it these yet yeah by the way i published this so this is a book he's showing, yeah. and the name of the book is what? It's Analysis of the Saltillo Style in Mexican Serapis. Yes. Catherine Drew Jenkins. This is, we have taken, we got permission from the Bancroft Library yes. to reproduce Catherine Drew Jenkins' master's thesis. I see. And that's what this is. And it's, when did that come out? Oh, probably three or four years ago. So It has a beautiful Walker painting. Yeah. Of, I of, think I sent you a Walker painting, actually, of one of the... That was one of, the, of the, one of the Serapis, yeah, because yeah. he liked painting them. Yes. And he painted in the 1870s, but he well, claims to have been depicting life in California in the 1830s. Mm. Yes. But again, and he shows pretty, you can see pretty distinct those. Yeah, I've are, seen that. Those I, are, I, sent, I, saw, I think I sent that to you. Saltillos. Yeah. And so, uh, we, uh, so, and so what it was is we re reproduced her master. In exact her what she did what she did. Right. And it's it's a good study. Yeah. It is. And then I wrote the second half of the book was an analysis of her analysis. Right. So I dissected her analysis. Right. Like when she said every saltillo I've ever seen has white. Mm -hmm. Okay. I said that was a very proper way to say it. It wasn't every saltillo no, had just white, the one she'd all the ones she'd seen. And so right. I compliment her. In other chapters, she says the word always and never. And I said, you can't say always and never. Is she still alive? No, no, she's long gone. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. 
And but so uh, it was the hardest thing I ever wrote because I found out in the middle of it that one of the conditions, because a friend of mine, Tom McCormick, was who published this. He's a Saltillo collector from Chicago, mm -hmm. and he um, and he got the permission. It turns out he went to like high school with the head librarian at the Bancroft Library right. at at uh, Berkeley. And uh, so I find out in the middle of it, she's going to edit my writing. And I thought, eh. right. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't change a word I said. Nice. But I was super careful about being totally respectful. They have what they call the, the Berkeley School of Latin Americanists. And they have written, you know, and they have the Bancroft Library. And Hubert Bancroft was a wealthy guy and collected fabulous. You really don't do... Western, Southwestern, Mexico research, if you don't go to the Bancroft yeah. Library, they have the best early documents and everything. They have a bunch of Dixon's great stuff, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, and I, and I think Bancroft got them 80,000 volumes and he gave a lot away. He sold mm. a big group to them. Bancroft's older brother was a book dealer back east. And in 1849, when the 49ers and all these guys got right. wealthy, he convinced his brother to go to San Francisco and to set up a book you know, book distributing, because he thought all these miners that couldn't even read anyway would own all these books. Right. It didn't work out that well. But he became fascinated with the West and collected these fabulous, fabulous volumes. So it's now called the Bancroft Library mm. for Herbert Bancroft. And it's just fabulous stuff. But I had to kind of go, kind of raise the bar to a certain standard that they let me know that they're proud of their Latin Americanists. So don't mess. Yeah. And so when I did criticize her, I tried to do it as professionally yeah. as I could. And, and I complimented her on a lot of things she did. She didn't look, I mean, I've seen, you know, the over thousand. So I have a much broader perspective. She only saw about a yeah. hundred. So yeah, yours is fan fiction, except it's not fiction. It's nonfiction. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, without her, you know, beginning, you know, education you couldn't get where you are well it was it was my least favorite thing because there was no color pictures yeah. of them and she dissected the angles and you know and the weft warp ratio yeah. determines the angle of design in a piece and mm -hmm. so they showed the different types of saltillos and the then the angles of the design and what colors were used with colors so they analyzed them in an amazing number of ways yeah but you and, look at them differently yeah because well, you look at them as art as art exactly first of all, so. and so we, we have a different perspective yeah and so but uh but McCormick got permission to do this, and we did it, and we sent it to him, and they and she really liked the fact that I did it the way I did. I was kind of proud of it, but it took me a whole summer to write this analysis and some and a little bit, and it was really hard because I just kept thinking uh, maybe I shouldn't quite say it that way. Yeah. Maybe I, so I had to up my game a little bit, but it was fun to do, so, and uh, but it's it, but. It's hard for a lot of you. I got to be really interested in Saltillos to yeah. read her part, <laughs> and then my part probably not much better because I mostly am just talking about her part, yeah. and then things that she didn't know about because she didn't see. I add, right. I add the things she says. So what's your legacy? Good. I don't know. You know, I've loved being a researcher. That's my biggest thrill. And so I'm now working on slave weaving, which I've mentioned a couple of times. That's a big thing. Right. But this is obviously a legacy for you. These oh, yeah. These are a legacy. We will, we will, and I haven't mentioned, but I have a partner, Jim Collins from Aspen, and he got interested about the same time I did in the 70s. And we bought Saltillos together. We traded them back and forth together. And, and at a certain point, we kind of combined our collections we've collected together. And, you know, we have well over 100 classic Saltillos mm. now between the two of us. and uh, Almost a tenth of what was done. Oh, yeah. And so... And more like 20%, but yeah. I don't want to brag. <laughs> but anyway, and so we don't know, you know, we're, he's a little older than I am and we're getting older. We don't know what we will end up doing with these. You know, we have, we've explored a lot of ideas. We've had a lot of business meetings discussing it. And so we don't know, you know, it's almost more than one institution can handle it. Yeah. Unless it was a pretty big institution and they really cared this much about it. So we may end up dividing things and giving smaller groups of definitive types to a lot of different museums, which would allow them to actually do shows of things right. and show them. 
And so that's one of our thoughts. We don't know. You know. And a book at some point? Oh, yeah. And that's what the the photographs I showed you are for. Yeah. We, he's been experimenting with printing things. We need them. We, even if you take, a, if you can put them on 12 by 18 inch paper, it still doesn't show all the detail. So we're trying to blow the things up and see what we do. Coffee table books, they say, are old fashioned. Mm. We're going to basically do a coffee table and make it into a book. It'll have to be really large. Didn't Seinfeld do that? Large. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they made a book that was a table. <laughs> was it? Did they? I didn't know that, but now I'm glad to do it. Makes sense. And so it needs to be something quite large. It'll yeah. be probably limited edition and quite large. And we're working, we're experimenting. I showed you some of the blow ups of the centers yes. and the things. And, and we're, we'll show that what we call a fingerprint of design mm -hmm. that, go, that goes into things. And uh, and so we will just see, you know. Yeah, I really thought I'd know far more about him than I do after five years, you know. And yeah. now it's still in each new one I find that I haven't seen. It's unlike any other one. Yeah, so it's you're... Got, yeah, it's got you're, characteristics. You're going you're, on 50 years now. Yeah, and so, you know, we talk about them being main shops. Jim's got a theory about, uh, you know, and why we see some really offshoots. We see one. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever even slightly like it, completely different. So Jim kind of has a theory that, that you know, they were expensive and nice and probably different weaving shops that didn't really make saltillos. Had a wealthy client who wanted a saltillo, so they made him one. Yeah. And maybe that's why it's so different than anything else we see. And commissions. Yeah. Somebody but, goes, I like this, but I don't want his. I want mine. I want mine, yeah. And so there's you have to really kind of dissect all of the different concepts of what how it really could have happened. What's the most saltillos that have ever been displayed at one time? Do you know? Well, I had I had eight sections of six. So what's that, 48? Mm -hmm. Almost so 50. Jeter's book is 28 pieces. Mm -hmm. And so our our show, Franz Meyer did an incredible job of hanging. It was a beautiful show. It was only up for a couple months. It was unfortunate. Mm. And they realized that they should have really booked it for a lot longer. Yeah, it's so, hard. Sometimes great shows are like that. Yeah. So. But so, but they're large. They're four feet by eight feet. So it takes a, you know, they're, yeah. they're it's a big ex exhibition. Yes, unless you fold and, them and, and with, do something interesting with, with that. my show that was called we called our show Patterns of Prestige, and and we had we divided our sections uh, probably two of each section were on mannequins, mm -hmm. and so so people could get an idea how they were not only seen as art but how they could be seen right as they accented the body, which was really the purpose of them, and so. Uh, so we we really don't know. We're still hard at it. We still, I've bought, I don't know, three classics in the last few months, which is a really tremendous amount for yeah. us to really find three that we really want. One was one I sold in the 80s to a guy who was in Baltimore at the time, and he moved up to uh, Massachusetts. I kind of lost touch with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, Some of those will pop out probably after this And it this popped podcast. out. <laughs> popped out, it went through a set of dealers' hands, and somebody goes, oh, no, winner will buy those. And so they sent me a picture of it, and I said, I know this piece. And so we went back to our records, and we figured out who we had sold right. it to back in the 80s. Right. And uh, so that's what happens with a lot of them. You know, we know the, the history of them. And yeah. we have documented the history. We have researched everybody that ever collected them extensively. Mm -hmm. To kind of see what their interest was, a lot of architects collected them. Yeah, it makes sense. Surprising, yeah, because yeah. they're very architectural. They are in the way they're built, and so a lot of architects, and you know, there's a lot of real interesting people that collected them. Fred Harvey Company handled quite a few of them, mm -hmm. and in the early uh, 20th century, the records were mostly late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Saltillos were priced for more than Navajos. Mm -hmm. A saltillo was more than a Navajo chief's blanket. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Herman Schweitzer, who ran the Fred Harvey department, really was crazy about him, like me. So he would get this. And so if you look at the journals, which I closely did the journals, mm -hmm. I got my own early ledger book. And on every saltillo, I wrote exactly what he wrote in my own ledger book. 
I spent, took me a week to do it, so mm -hmm. I know exactly. And so, and they, I think they did 18,000 textiles. Mm -hmm. They ledgered mm -hmm. maybe 30. I can't remember the number exactly now. But I went through all of them, and I, every time there was a Rio Grande or a Saltillo mentioned, I wrote exactly down what he said. And he would say, and you know, they had all these codings and you know, all that kind of stuff. Right. He, was, he was he was a German. He was very meticulous about doing all this nonsense. And he, he did, all, he, he had ledgered them all himself. Mm. So for a, it would say Navajo Chief's Blanket, $200, $200. Mm -hmm. Saltillo, Saltillo, diamond centered, red field, unusual element, blah, blah, blah. He would describe them in much greater detail. Yeah, they're rare. Yeah. And so he would do that. And then there'd come the price. Okay. He would come in later and the prices were dated when mm -hmm. they did it. He'd come in later and he'd scratch out the price and raise it up and write a new date in. Mm. And on Saltillo, sometimes he did it four and five times. So if he couldn't get it sold, he just raised the price. Well, or I think he didn't want to sell them. Yeah, something. It could be. Well, something... But a lot of times, those new dates were only a few days after he ledgered them. It wasn't a long time. Yeah, and I, he I, just started thinking that thing should be worth more. Well, and as he sees more things, he realizes these are rarer than can be. He's dealing in most of the great textiles that are coming out. That are coming old ones, out. Uh, most of which are ending up in Hearst collection. Yeah, you know. And well, a lot, not not most. But he was a lot. paying big bucks. Yeah, but uh, there was a guy paying more than Hearst did. Yeah, who was that? His name was George Seeley. Mm. And he was probably would have been the hero of Navajo textiles. Seely got the Spiegelberg out of Schweitzer. And then when Seely died, he got pneumonia in a New York City hotel room in the early 40s during mm. the early war. Next thing that happens is uh, uh, Barton. That was Alfred Barton. Mm. He was one of the... He was another one of the big yeah, competitors in Florida. in Florida, exactly. Barton is at George C. Lee's widow's house within days. Ah. And so I've got these great letters of correspondence between Barton's widow, I mean, being George C. Lee's widow and Barton after the stuff. And several other people were after him too, but Barton was the most aggressive. And when it came to the Spiegelberg, he says, I'm sure your husband made a mistake in his records on how much he paid for it. I'm sure it was a mistake. <laughs> and tell us, tell us about that. What is that? The Spiegel. T tell us about Spiegel. that. Well, the Spiegelberg was was owned by Abe Spiegelberg. He was one of the early governors and merchants yes. in Santa Fe. Yes. Early Jewish merchants. There was Seligmans. There was Spiegelberg, and this blanket was collected by um, Fred Harvey Company, mm -hmm. and was one of Herman Schweitzer, who was the the head guy. There was favorite right. pieces, so he kept it. So. Uh, William Randolph Hearst was aggressively buying blankets yes. and aggressively saying, send me more of the good blankets. You're not sending me right. more good blankets. He was like, yeah. and he was paying record prices. Yeah. 1200 bucks. Yeah. Well, he paid 3500 at the time for yeah. the Spiegelberg. Wow. And that's why, that's why uh, Barton was able to say, Oh, I'm sure. I bought a lot of blankets. I'm sure that's a mistake. That's a typo. He wrote. He <laughs> might have really there. believed that too. Yeah. Who knows? And so, but he he bought it for fifteen hundred from the widow. Finally. Yeah. Well, she doesn't know and has no outlet. Yeah, she had no idea to know. Yeah. But he had great stuff. He he loved Rio Grande. You've yeah. seen the Barton book. I have. Great Rio Grande. He had great Saltillos, but Bar but uh, Barton wanted nothing to do with the Saltillos, so they stayed with Seely. Mm. And so one. One came up for sale at Sotheby's, and that's where I first got the name. And so Sotheby's would allow you to write a letter to the consigner. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't give you the consigner's name or address and information, but you could write a letter saying, I purchased this, mm -hmm. and do you have any additional information on it that you didn't give to Sotheby's? Right. And they would present, they'd send that letter with my... Name and address right. and let them contact me. And so most people didn't know that, but since I worked for Sotheby's, I found this out. And so I sent letters on everything I got. And a lot of times I got more pieces mm. because of it. Right. And more information. Hopefully. Yeah. And Sotheby's really, Sotheby's was a funny place because they really were a dealer. They were a wholesale for dealers. Early and, on. 
in the early on days. Yeah, that's changed. You, you ever seen a marked catalog? I don't know what you mean by marked. Well, so if you were a dealer, a known dealer, you could request in any category the names and addresses of all the people who bought things in the sale. So it literally lists the names and addresses of who bought every hmm. item. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And if you were a well-known dealer, they would give you all the information because they it figured it helped dealers out because it was mainly dealers that bought stuff from them. Yeah, a little different now. A little different now. <laughs> but I That's why I haven't heard of a Mark catalog. That's right. Nobody ever has. Yeah. And I found out that that was... A thing because I saw marked catalogs when I worked at Sotheby's and I said, "What the hell are these?" And it, nobody really knew. Yeah. And so I kind of uncovered it again. But and then I've seen them for some of the uh, early uh, sales that mm. they did on different topics on furniture and things like that. I've never found one. They didn't do many Indian art sales before. You know the uh, Park one, the uh, uh, Bennett Park, Park Bernay. Park Bernay. No. Uh, they did, uh, uh, the first big sale was the uh, C.G. Wallace. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, then, that, the, and well, then the McCormick. That, that was with, yeah, Park Bernay. That was the C.G. Yeah. Wallace. Yeah, and then it was the, then the C.G. Wallace, and then there was the McCormick sale, which was McCormick Ranch yeah. in Phoenix. And then they sold their collection. And then that's what broke the Indian business wide open by pricing. People had no idea what kind of prices they were going to bring. Yeah. And there's still, some of those are still records today. That was, what, 70 Six or yeah. 75. Those 75. Are still, I those are still record prices today. From what the money was worth then, they probably definitely were. But oh, yeah. Yes. No, I'm even talking about for same money. Yeah, right. You know? And that was just highly touted. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, Wallace made a lot of it up. Who made it? The leakiest stuff. Yeah, a lot all. of it was. And, the, and he was the first one that really made a big deal out of hosting good luck. And he calls good luck belts that are good lucks that are obviously not good luck and he was older and so he just kind of went on memory he didn't right. really keep records he just, you mean like us yeah just like us yeah. <laughs> well i'm pretty good i'm pretty star i'm i document everything I'm really sure good yeah. yeah what are you gonna do with your papers i don't know somebody somebody will be interested in oh them, absolutely probably. you know yeah, those are important papers. yeah i have uh you know in my in my 28 years at Totalina, we only buy rugs from a 15, 12 mile radius of Totalina. Mm -hmm. I, I realized in the early days I couldn't afford to support the whole Navajo Nation, so we only buy from the small area. I bought 8,000 rugs on yeah. that community. In 28 years. In 28 yeah. years, you know. So, and, uh, and the coolest thing is I personally put $6 million in Navajo Weaver's hands, handing him the money. Yeah. So, yeah, we've no. made a huge influence. Yeah, and you've done a book, and you've done yeah, we did the, the book genealogy of the weavers, and you know what my book sells for now? Uh, three fifty over two thousand. Oh my god! And I sold them for one hundred twenty-five dollars, and everybody bitched and moaned it was so expensive. I didn't. No, you didn't. You bought Bunches. you bought fifty of them right off the bat. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> and, and I won't say it because this is on the recording. Yeah, I, I was going to say <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> somebody that wouldn't buy my books because he thought they were too expensive. Yeah, no. Somebody that sold an awful lot of rugs yeah. and a lot of two gray hills. Yeah. And he woke up way too late and then he wanted, and then he bought some and they sold so quickly, wanted more. And by then we were out of print. So, yeah, I think you had to get some for me at the end. I, think you, I tried to. Yeah. <laughs> I kept, and I have a few. And, and, and they went, they started 500 and 800. And I just had somebody who looked for the book. They, they called me and said they paid $1,800 for it. Wow. Uh, Online, that's the cheapest they could find it at. Glad I still have that 50. That's good. I wish you did. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know how many I have. Well, I had have I been few. smart, I would have put 500 aside and said I was out of print. I never expected that. Yeah, you can't. Happen, you though. can't figure that out. No. But, you know, and it's too hard to try to reprint something like that. I give them away now to people that buy really nice two gray. Yeah, that makes sense. I did the book to support the Weavers. So if they're Buying an upper end two gray hills from me, I'll give them a book. Yeah, I gave one away at Las Vegas from a guy that bought a really nice Marianaba curly. And Marianaba was like number three. There was Daisy and Bessie, and Marianaba, I think, was the third in line for that upper echelon of yes. weavers. And I had one, and uh, and I explained that to him, and I said, well, and he was hemming and hawing for a minute because it was kind of expensive. And I said, I'll give you a book. And then I showed him. I have an A books, Linda 
printed me an A books thing and and there's five of my books for sale and they're all over two thousand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what mine are. Mine sells for two forty five now. Yeah. And we're down to the last two hundred in my book too. So I of which one? The Maynard Dixon book. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well it's it's a, it's it kind of makes you proud when you do something that's becomes valuable. You know, there's yeah. not a, you know, you, you get a lot of you, there's not a lot of books that sell for that kind of money. Yeah. And I'm sure it's just a thing right now. No, it's because there's great knowledge and there's limited numbers. It'll be the same with your Satya book. Good, good information. I'll buy another 50. Yeah. Well, this time I'll be more judicious it, with it my selling. It might be a little more limited market because not that we've made sure not that many people have Satya yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's an important, you know. It's we'll do something really good with yeah, it. I mean, you know, yeah. We're trying to figure out what that is right now. And, you know, fortunately my partner has is made enough money that it's not a matter about the money. Anymore. Yeah, that's good. So that's we can buy anything we want. We can hold them as long as we want and, and potentially give them away. And, you know, he's older than me. It may end up being my decision what to do. Yeah. So what ultimately happens to him, we don't know. We're just, you know, we've just had so much fun getting him and information. Oh, no, and I really should say, though, that I did all this information. I filled out all these analysis forms. I went on every crazy topic I could come up with and things. And so Jim one time said, let me have your information. He said, I want to go through it and look at it and see what you really have. Because he knew I had it, but he didn't know. Right. He digitized everything. It's now... 50 or 60 volumes of books. It's, he has a great big bookshelf. It's full mm. of 50, 60 volumes, and everything's digitized. It's all on computer now. He can go to any in, bit of information. I did it all longhand. Right. So mm -hmm. now it's amazing because I call him and I go, hey, what about that salt <laughs> here or there? And he said, Give me, let me turn my computer on. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't do his computer, so yeah. I don't have that access, but it's amazing what he's done. <laughs> And we constantly, every time we come up with the slightest tidbit of information, it goes right into the files. Yeah. So. Well, this is why I wanted to have you on to talk about Sotillas. Well, it's it's I've been enjoyable. Yes. I haven't talked. I don't talk about it much. No. More than I should, though. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, you have such an interesting history, and I encourage people to go listen to the other podcasts I've done, because you talk about how you got where you were as a Native American Indian dealer, you know, and dealing in... Well, owning the, a trading post and all the other stuff. The hotel that the show was just at? Yes. Was where I sold stuff to Elvis. And, oh, that's funny. And, and, and Elvis Presley Boulevard dead ends into this hotel. It's called the Westgate now. It was a Hilton then. Yes. And they have all these pictures from the late 60s of Elvis all over the place. And that's when I was selling him stuff. So I look at these pictures. I just cracked up. Yeah. What is that like to see? I mean, your whole life's gone complete circle. Yeah, it's a whole circle. You know, your last a... show is where you sold Elvis stuff in the 60s. Yeah, in the late 60s. So it's kind of a... Kind of amazing, been an amazing journey. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, I've never gotten over it. That's all I can say. <laughs> I'm still as thrilled. I just bought a couple of slave blankets at this show. So buying two at one show, that was an amazing thing. Yeah. Good. Well, it sounds like it was a good show. For yeah, me. so it was a good show. That is a good show for me. Yeah. You know, to me, it's about what I can buy. Yeah. Well, you're buying again to collect, not to sell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so... And so and I've been doing a lot of research on that now, and and you know, slaving isn't the better, isn't the part, isn't what I care about really. A lot of people have, there's been a lot of people writing it. And, and the first stuff was kind of in the fifties and sixties, but I'm researching all the information about slaving and stuff. And but lately, there's been really a lot of information coming out about Navajo slaving. You yeah. Know. 25% to 50% of Navajos were slaves. Yeah. It's a part of their life we don't really look at. I'm not interested in the slavery really at all. Plenty of people have researched it, they substantiated it, we know what commonly happened. I'm interested in the material culture. Yeah. I'm interested in what that influence, like they talk about the... Or oppression, his, however you want to look well, at it. Yeah, they, but they talk about the Hispanic influence on Navajo weaving. And the Navajos saw saltillos by 1800. They didn't use the styles till 1870s. Mm. So it wasn't like they were so overwhelmed with Spanish stuff that they adopted to it. It was really the slaving issue that really brought it mm. to the forefront. That'll be, and, the, that'll be our, th our 
fourth podcast. Yeah, that'll be a whole new thing. <laughs> and I'm writing ferociously now about it and kind of digging into all the angles. But I'm really just interested in how it affected the art. Yeah. And that's the key thing that I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm the sure. material culture. I'm sure it did. It has it. to. It had to. Yeah. Well, you know, well, they were being dictated. But what it had trauma to really <laughs> a lot to do with was the relationship between the captive and the captor. Because many, many times the captive became the matriarch of the family. Mm. Bob Gallegos, his great grandmother was a Navajo slave mm -hmm. from Chimayo. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I've got I've got a Navajo slave blanket that we have that, that's the best documented. Mm -hmm. We know who the Navajo slave was. We know when she was picked up by a Spanish mm. salt gathering expedition. She escaped Bosque Redondo and was walking back to Denatal. Got captured by out near Estancia, east of Albuquerque. Mm. She got picked up and taken down south of Berlin and sold to a family. Mm. And a friend of Harry Mira's was digging in an old Spanish mission there, and Mira tells him, you know, ask all those Spanish guys working for if they have any blankets. See what comes in, take pictures of them for me. This guy's name was Joseph Toulouse. And they were good buddies. He was an anthropologist, archaeologist too. And, and so... They're bringing in all these real grands, and he's taking pictures of them. And one day, this guy brings in this blanket, and he's looking at, look at it. He goes, "This isn't a real grand blanket. This is Navajo." He goes, "Yeah, my grandmother was a Navajo, mm. and she was she belonged to my grandfather mm. and married my father." Mm. And so, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of those stories. Yeah, well, there's there's they're now coming out more and more and more yeah. because you know in in the Catholic Church records, they didn't want their slaves to be heathens, so they baptized them. And so the baptismal records shows thousands of mm. Navajos in them, mm. astounding amount yeah. of Navajos in them. And they list them by culture. They're a Ute or they're a Navajo or, right. you know, they live it. And they're listed as the property of yeah. the families. And so we're getting a much broader glimpse of this. And you know, those, the great Hispanic villages up above Chamayo, Truchas, Trompas, El Valle, mm -hmm. have been very redneck about being, we're pure Spanish. And, you know, they don't like Anglos to move in and everything. And it's always been really that way. Or they're all pure Spanish. Well, they start doing 23 and Me. Yeah. And they start finding out that they have a lot of native blood. Far more native blood. So now they want native rights. They want the money the natives get because they're more native than Spanish. So they're completely yeah. reversing their whole position in well, all this. But also I think it changes the way they look at themselves. Yeah. Right? Well, it is. It's, right? It's like, oh, there's another side of me. Yeah, I just got a right. big, I just got a they great. Did, yeah, because they didn't have any you know, um, say in that. No. And, you know, and it was way before they ever... You know, came about it, but yeah. they were really sort of macho about being pure Spanish and nothing. First off, the conquistadors didn't bring any women, so there's kind of no such thing as a first generation Spaniard. Yeah. The first generation were all mestizos. They all yeah. had, yeah, it's their culture. I see. It. I mean, yeah. I understand you. Everybody, re I think, relates to who they are, their culture, and what they are. Yeah. And when those things change in your mind, all of your world can change. Really, you can be. Oh well, this is something I want to investigate. Yeah, I, I, I just got a great article out of the New York Times about uh, all the people that are discovering that they're native blood, they're yeah, Spanish, sure. and they're doing a lot of work in the San Luis Valley yeah. around Alamosa for and in, in finding a lot of slaving records there. There's a lot of people working on this, but from different perspectives than me. They're kind of still trying to prove it happened. Mm -hmm. Where I'm saying, hell yes, it happened, but what became of it? Yeah. And so I'm looking for the, the things in blankets that make them slave blanket. And a slave blanket isn't one thing. It could be any combination right. of things, you know. And that was a big thing for the, the Navajos when they were finally out of Bosque Redondo. They weren't going to sign any treaties to go back to their reservation, to the now reservation, until they could get their you know, the people that have been stolen and taken from them. Yeah, that well, they, ins component. they insisted on that, and they they were still looking 35 years later. Yeah. It's shocking. Yeah, no. Well, 35 years later, it. <laughs> they still wanted their people yeah, back. I'm sure they were looking until they died. Yeah, they looked till they died. And yeah. so, and those kind of things, it's amazing to show how they, uh, how 
anxious they were to keep their tribe together and yeah. keep their. Yeah. And so, you know, and this is t this tying into a lot of the research I did at Totalina, too, because there's a clan called the Nakai Dene, and that's the Nakai is the word for Mexicans. Right. So, Nakai Dene means you're part Spanish and part Navajo. Right. And that's, and so it's not bloodline necessarily. It can go a lot of different ways. It can go linguistically, because mm -hmm. if you were taken as a child into an Hispanic village and spent 10, 20 years there, you, you don't know your clan. Right. You also don't know how to speak Navajo. So when they got to go back to their own people, a lot of times they were considered freaks because they couldn't speak the language and they didn't know where they were from. And so that whole group, but they were Spanish speaking, that whole group is also called Nakai Dene. So there's a lot of different ways you can become Nakai Dene. Mm. And I'm starting to realize that now that, uh, that uh, that little aspect of it is going to tie into my my new project. Yeah, I'm sure. And mm -hmm. it's just like we have one, one of our clans is called Nashusha, and that's Bear Clan. And the Bear Clan is Hopi Tewa. Mm -hmm. And Hopi Tewa is the Pueblos that left the Rio Grande Valley and moved out to Second Mesa. Yeah. And that's the only Mesa that speaks Tewa. The rest of them speak the Hopi speak, right. Kiris or whatever it is. And so, but they're Tewa. And they, they, a group of them settled in Totalina. And so we know they're all, they're Bear Clan. Mm. And so what do they use? Three cord side selvage, mm. Pueblo side selvage yes, yes, yes. in their two gray hills. Daisy Toggleshe comes from that family. She used three cord side selvage. Mm. Mariana, a police girl, those were all from that same family, and their side cord selvages, three cord. Yeah, yeah. Pueblo side cord. All of them. And the old, old timers, while well, I still got to interview them before they passed away, told me they remember when their Pueblo relatives used to come mm. to Totalina to visit. Mm. And that was always a big thing because these were their ancient. And then I had a group from Hopi uh, come one time. I forget what their why they came, but there was a whole group of them. There was like 20, 25 Hopis. And I started telling them this story and they're going, you're kidding. Mm. I'm going, no. I started showing them the genealogy charts and all this. They were amazed. They said, we had no idea this really happened. Mm. And then I started talking about the three court salvage that was Pueblo and they, they, ad they adopted that mm -hmm. to it and everything. And so mm. I think, uh, so I I can see kind of the collision of the slaving and the and the uh, Totalina research yeah. kind of colliding together <laughs> at some point. Get going, so, man. Yeah, keep it up <laughs> as long as you can. <laughs> as long as I can, I'm still at it. So uh, All right. it's fun. All right, Mark. We'll call it a day. Okay, thank you. you what time is it? I don't Did know. we close in before one o'clock? Oh God, my wife is probably pulling her hair out. Okay. Yeah. So as Linda pulls her hair out, we will. Call it a day and let you go look at some art. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So I appreciate it. I'm, you know, people call me, they go, I feel I know you. And did you really sell to Elvis Presley? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. I'm going, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs>